Hi, this is Marisa Benedict, and you're listening to The Other Side of the Bill. Hello, and welcome to The Other Side of the Bell, a podcast dedicated to everything trumpet, brought to you by Bob Reeves Brass. We'll help you take your trumpet playing to the next level. I'm John Snell, trumpet specialist at Bob Reeves Brass, and I'll be your host for today. My special guest today is trumpeter David Washburn. We'll get to Dave's interview here in a moment after a word from our sponsor and some trumpet news. Today's episode is brought to you by Bob Reeves Brass, who share your passion for creating extraordinary music. You know that feeling when your instrument just clicks and the music flows effortlessly? That's what Bob Reeves Brass has been helping customers do since 1968. We've helped brass musicians like you achieve their dreams by ensuring their equipment is always in perfect harmony. We know you want to immerse yourself in the art of music making, and we're here to remove any barriers between you and your creative vision. At Bob Reeves Brass, we work closely with you to understand your unique needs and provide tailored solutions like valve alignments, custom fit mouthpieces from our extensive stock models or a hand carved custom mouthpiece, gap adjustments with the Reeves sleeve system, or even tweaking your existing gear. No matter your level of experience, we offer free consultations and serve musicians from all walks of life. And if you're looking for the perfect instrument to inspire your next musical masterpiece, we proudly carry the exquisite Van Lahr line of trumpets and flugelhorns, as well as the superb Charlie Davis line of trumpets. What's more, Bob Reeves Brass is taking their commitment to your musical journey even further. We're now offering a carefully curated collection of top-notch products designed specifically for brass musicians. You'll find premium guard bags to protect your beloved instruments, a diverse range of mutes from renowned brands like Ulvane Mutes, Yupon and Okura Mutes from Japan, Trumcore Mutes, Rayano, Clary Wood Mutes, and Charlie Davis Mutes, ensuring you have the perfect mute for every performance. But that's not all. We've also got you covered when it comes to essential maintenance supplies with a hand-picked selection of valve oils, lubricants, and more to keep your instruments in tip-top shape. Bob Reeves Brass is truly your one-stop shop for everything you need to fuel your passion and create music that touches hearts and souls. So go ahead, let us help you elevate your sound to new heights. Don't wait another moment to elevate your musical journey with Bob Reeves Brass. Connect with us at bobreeves.com, shoot us an email at info at bobreeves.com, and keep up with the latest news on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter at Bob Reeves Brass. Embrace your passion for music and let Bob Reeves Brass be your partner in creating the extraordinary. Well, I'm excited to bring Dave Washburn on here in a moment. Uh, There are a couple things I do want to talk to you about. First things first, I want to give a huge thank you to Steve Johnson and the folks at Virtuosity Musical Instruments in Boston. What an amazing store they have. Uh, And not just because they have cold brew on tap. (laughs) And then uh, I guess the Monday after I was there, they also got a a fancy espresso machine too, which is probably a good thing because I was already vibrating with all the cold brew I drank. But lest I digress. Uh, I mean, we had so, we sold out essentially. I mean, we booked up completely. We had a waiting list for alignments and consultations. Uh, so thank you, Boston and New England, for showing up uh, and in a big way. I know we had folks come in from New Hampshire and Maine, and of course all over Massachusetts. And I mean, Boston is just a hotbed of brass playing anyway, with uh, New England Conservatory there and uh, Berkeley. Uh, in fact. Shout out to Tiger Okoshi, good friend and previous podcast guest. Uh, He dropped in to say hi and chat with me and brought his trumpet studio with some absolutely fabulous players. Uh, So thank you, Tiger. Great to see you, my friend. Um, And then also shout out to Kevin and Ryan, who uh, came by for alignments and mouthpieces and are avid listeners of the podcast. So I want to give you guys a little shout out. It was great meeting you. And thank you again for coming by. Uh, So if you're in and around Boston, they are a Bob Reeves Brass dealer, so feel free to drop into Virtuosity, and uh, even if you don't need a Bob Reeves mouthpiece, 
uh, do yourself a favor and pop into the store. Great folks there, wonderful, knowledgeable staff, and uh, I wished I lived closer. <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to be a regular, uh, regular visit for us, so uh, we can't wait to come back. But wait, there's more. We are not done traveling. Even though there's just a few months left in the year, uh, we are going back to one of our favorite locations. We haven't been there in four years. And many of you have asked us when we are going back to this place. And that place, of course, is Dillon Music in Woodbridge, New Jersey. So Steve Dillon and Jim McCombs and all the folks there are going to be hosting us. Uh, Are you ready? The dates will be November 9th. 10th and 11th. So that's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Just coming up here in a few weeks for valve alignments, mouthpieces. We're going to bring some fun things. We're going to bring the new Boomstar mouthpiece, the Bobby Burns uh, EWF mouthpiece, the new uh, secret menu orchestral mouthpieces that we're making now, and, uh, you know, whatever else we can find lying around the shop. So if you want to come visit, we are doing it by appointment. Certainly if you want to get a valve alignment, but even for a consultation, uh, obviously if you walk in, we're not going to turn you away. But, uh, you know, if you want to wait for your valve alignment or make sure there's time to meet with either Brett or myself, uh, what you're going to do is email sales at dylanmusic.com, or you can call them at 732 732- Six three four three three nine nine, and all that information is at dylanmusic.com and we'll make sure we have this information down in the description and on the show notes. We'll try to make it as easy as possible for you to find us. So again, the dates coming up here in a few weeks, November 9th, 10th, and 11th, a pop-up shop at Dylan Music in New Jersey. So all the folks in the New York, New Jersey area, even maybe as far as Philadelphia, uh, not too far to drive and bring your horn or to come and try one of over 300 mouthpieces, flugelhorn, piccolo, cornet, you name it, we will have it there. Also, I want to take a brief moment here to mention that we do have some guard bags left. We got our shipment after a year. Uh, We do have primarily the triple bags left. Uh, I got a lot of those this time. Those are the most popular so far. We have some singles and doubles coming in early 2024, but if you are looking for a triple case, uh, the guard bags are incredible. I love them myself. And uh, some of the styles are already sold out, uh, won't be in until next year, but we do have uh, some left. So all of those are available at trumpetmouthpiece.com on our online store. Uh, so check those out. We do have a couple wheelies too, if you're in the market for one of those, the quad wheelie bags. I think we have a couple of those left as well, but they do go fast. And we just got this morning a shipment from Olven, our good friends, uh, Lasse Lundgren, at uh, Ulven Mutes in Sweden. Uh, so we were out of some of the mutes, uh, the Dizzy Cup Mute especially, we've been out for a while and those are back in stock. So if you're looking for the uh, Dizzy Gillespie Cup Mute, uh, we have that in stock as well as their brand new Poppy Straight Mutes in a few different colors and styles. Uh, so the, all of those will be on the website. And the last thing I'd like to mention, this is a shout out to our, another avid listener, TJ, up in Northern California. He called me and uh, brought up an interesting uh, concept. And I know early on I had some kind of prefab questions that I'd ask folks. And I, I tried to ask questions about comeback players and amateur players, things like that, that would hopefully be topical. Um, but I, didn't, I don't think I really did a good job at that. But he, he was interested in getting more content uh, for those kinds of players, amateur players and uh, weekend warrior types, as I like to call them, and of which I am a weekend warrior myself. Uh, So if you have any suggestions in terms of how to integrate that kind of content into the other side of the bell, I'd love to hear from you because I know you players are out there. Um, I know uh, not all of us are going to go and play in the Chicago Symphony or be in the studios. And although it's inspiring and great to hear from players that do that kind of thing, uh, you know, sometimes that's not always topical to a player that has a family and jobs and other things uh, or just doesn't have the aspirations to do that kind of thing, you know, at a professional level, but just wants to have fun and make the most out of music and obviously still do the best they can on the instrument. So let me know. Let me know what kind of content you want to be here uh, you want to hear and if it's something like questions I should ask or certain players uh, types of players you want to have on here I'm all ears again my email here john j-o-h-n at bobreeves.com so I'd love to hear from you again this is your show uh, I'm just here turning on the mic and I only get that right about half the time. So <laughs> so you let me know what you want to hear. And uh, especially, again, for those uh, amateur weekend warrior types. And we'll see how we can integrate that into the show. All right. I think I've talked enough. Let's get right to my interview with David Washburn. 
Well, I'm so excited about my special guest today, Dave Washburn. Dave is a Yamaha performing artist and serves as the principal trumpet of the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra. His artistry has also graced the LA Opera Orchestra as an associate principal trumpet and the Los Angeles Master Chorale as principal trumpet. David's international experience includes a tenure as principal trumpet and soloist with the Hong Kong Philharmonic Orchestra. A familiar name in Hollywood, he has contributed to the soundtracks of iconic films like Rogue One, Spider-Man Homecoming, and Titanic, and has been a fixture in the John Williams trumpet section for over two decades. David's educational contributions are notable. He instructs at Biola University and Azusa Pacific University, and has taught at several other prestigious institutions around Southern California. He boasts a Master's of Music from the New England Conservatory of Music and a Bachelor of Music from the University of Southern California. A featured soloist with various global orchestras, Dave continues to captivate audiences with highlights including performances at renowned chamber music festivals and concerts. And now without further ado, here's my interview with David Washburn. All right, joining me today in the Bob Reeves Brass Podcast Studio is Dave Washburn. Dave, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And let's talk about the trumpet, and let's go straight from the beginning. Uh, did the trumpet kind of fall in your lap, or did you choose the trumpet? What? How did that come about? Well, I chose a trumpet because I found out my dad played trumpet. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. I went to my parents wanted to play trumpet, and mm -hmm. they said no. So my dad didn't want to have a young trumpeter in the house when he is really? studying to, to teach electrical engineering at Long Beach State. So... Really? Um, he didn't want to have the noise, the racket around? I guess around? not. But we went over to his friend's house that had his old Miha trumpet and, mm -hmm. and stuff, and um, I asked if I could play it. And after I played it, his friend said, Harold, got to take your son and get a trumpet tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was his friend? or he was, That was his friend. So I, pressure on Yeah, him and, and so I had a, a trumpet, and I took lessons with Gene Rooker, oh, who cool. was a... Uh, uh, senior at uh cal state long beach wow so um, wow so how, how old are you then the i was in the summer of fifth grade so, going into sixth grade so quite young yeah 11 years old quite now you said your dad was a trumpet player like was he yeah. listening to trumpet did you have like that kind of influence would he play around oh, yeah. town or anything like that or uh, he was in the san gabriel symphony okay he was older when um i was born mm -hmm. so he his his playing days were over okay but um had recordings and so you're stuff. somewhat surrounded by music and oh yeah got into lessons pretty much right away oh yeah yeah awesome from day one i had had a teacher and you were just was that it you were going I that mean, was it yeah i enjoyed it it was fun yeah um, my dad built uh two doors on the, my bedroom they were both <laughs> solid so so i guess it was a good thing he was an engineer <laughs> yeah. he knew how to do that he knew how to solve the problem he knew how to problem solve yeah wow so uh so what did it look like in terms of like just, I mean, I got since your dad played professionally, semi professionally, something like semi that. Semi professionally, yeah. Yeah. So you knew the, the what that looked like at least. Um, is that something you just decided this is what I want to do f for my career? Or no, I just knew I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I was also my dad since he was older had already made his money. We were members of the Long Beach Yacht Club, mm -hmm. so we were on a sailing team, swim team, and so you did all kinds um, of venture regulars. All, yeah, and, and then it was just like. Uh, I after Jean Rooker, I went to Joan Larue, and mm -hmm. she said, uh, "You're going to USC to stay with John Kleinman." This is when I was in eleventh grade, and it's like, "Okay, I I think I'll I like it. I'll I'll try it." Wow. So I didn't really know if I was good enough. So she kind of she kind of just said, oh, "This is what you're doing." Yeah. Which I love Joan, and Joan was teaching yeah. when I went to Cal State Long Beach. And yeah. she's an institution here in L.A. Can you tell yeah. a little bit about her and what it was like studying with her? Well, I'm assuming this was like, what, high school age now? Or? Well, no, I was in junior high. I uh, After my first year, Gene Rooker went off back east to sell insurance mm -hmm. and, and raise his family. Mm -hmm. um, so she wanted me as a student because she heard me at the Solo Ensemble Festival. And I happened to live probably a five-minute walk from her. So when a student would cancel, she would call my mom and said. I've got an opening. And my mom's like, you got a lesson. Okay. <laughs> you know, and then That's finally funny. I got into her studio in, mm -hmm. in seventh grade for yeah. full time. And I studied with her through, through uh, 
high school. So for five, five, six years almost. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. I mean, was it just fundamentals, basics? Yeah. You know, going and, through and, literature, and, things like going that. Going literature a lot. Well, you learn how to transpose. We started working on orchestral excerpts in high school, mm -hmm. and uh, just um, a lot of solo work. Really. A like lot of jump, solo literature. Into music. Yeah, at least two solos a year that you would perform. Wow. So, Even at that young of an age. Yeah, solo ensemble festival, plus you're playing, you know, she had me in the Southeast Youth Symphony and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So So you were you were cranking. Yeah. <laughs> you were going. So yeah. she says, okay, Dave, you're going to USC to study with Kleinman. Right. Um, right. I mean, did you know who John Kleinman was at the time? I did was, not. Really? But you were about to find out. I was about to find out. So and I my audition for him was uh, the second and third movement of the Haydn Trumpet Concerto because mm -hmm. I had just played it with the high school orchestra. Mm -hmm. And then he turns it to the first movement and says, let's play this. <laughs> I'm like, <"Whoa." laughs> so um, he was big on being able to, to play things unprepared. Already just jumping yeah. into that. Yeah. You learn just from the audition. Yeah. And so, luckily my dad yeah. played it on, you know, the his stereo many, many times. So I, it was in my ear. So you had it in your head. Yeah. Long story short, you got into USC. I did. And you got into Kleinman's studio. Yes. So um, if we could, I'd like to spend some time talking about John. Oh, absolutely. You know, you know John's yeah. very influential here at the shop. He was Bob Reeves' teacher. And yeah. those of you who heard Bob's episode of the podcast know that Kleinman bought Bob his first lay. So right. he's the reason right. we're here today talking. Um, do you remember your first lesson with John? I do. I left with tears in my eyes. Um, he was... He had a way of, of just letting you know what level you should be at. And then if you weren't at that level, he was very to the point. Hmm. So um, he ended up being a lot more than, than a teacher. Mm -hmm. My dad was um, sick with Alzheimer's. Mm. So he kind of stepped in and really guided me. I had a, just a wonderful experience with my four years with him. Yeah, And it's real interesting, his lesson style it was just like he would assign stuff and you would go through it at the lesson mm -hmm. but at the next lesson you wouldn't play what he assigned you would go on to the next week so each lesson was a sight reading experience so it it merely impacted me and in, in, in that sight reading is really important and especially in the work you do today, right? <laughs> I see, could see where that comes in handy, right. and that you know, and that's kind of—I don't want to say controversial, but you know, in terms of teaching that kind of tough love kind of thing, right? You know, Bob spoke about that where he would—he was very demanding in his lessons and always right. had, you know, had the highest expectation, right? Which would make a student feel not necessarily the best, but he always would pick them up, you know, before they walk out the door, or, right? You know. Kind of things right. like, look, this is where you have to be, but yeah. But yeah. when you did reach his level of what he expected, he was very compliment. Mm -hmm. He he would you know make sure you knew that hey, that's that's really good. Yeah. Did he play much for you? In One lessons? note. One note. In four years. In four years. Wow. Because he had already had his first heart attack. Oh, okay. So he wasn't playing, and then he was trying to do some schloss. I was trying to do some Schlossberg, and I couldn't get it soft enough. Uh-huh. Give me your heart. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the most beautiful middle G I, I've ever heard with the front end. Just It's just like, it was, okay. Even after That's the heart soft. attack. Yeah. You know, geez. Yeah. Um, what, I mean, did you end up learning more about him in terms of his life or the kind of playing that he did? Or was that since it was like later in his career? He would tell me stories about mm -hmm. being in, in the, in the, um, with the Fox studio orchestra. Mm -hmm. He was in the, one of the first trumpets for that. And I would go and listen to the movies that, that, that he played on. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's a lot of stories about, about climbing. There's mm -hmm. some good, there's some, you know that don't put him in the, the best of light, but I've never experienced that on myself. It was just always, uh, I guess I'm honored to be one of his last students mm -hmm. that, that I had lessons with him for four and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. And had an so, impact on you. And oh playing. yeah. Did you guys, yeah. did you guys go over much, uh, I mean, was it literature? Was it a combination of 
you know, because I know with Joan, you did a lot of music. Right. Was it similar with Climbing or was it a mix of It was similar because Joan was kind of in the same mold of, of teaching. Mm -hmm. He would give you a lot of exercises that, that he wanted to do. He had his own set of exercises. Um, but then he would tell you how to practice in the Schlossberg book. Hmm. You know, this is what his version of practicing Schlossberg would be. And he would play, um, he had his own exercises that he came up, climbing one, climbing two, mm -hmm. power range, um, stuff like that. And it was either really loud playing or really, really soft playing. So if you can play loud and you can play soft, everything in between is, is, is going to be there. Interesting. Yeah. So practicing at the extremes. Right. Um, any more that you can speak about this Schlossberg stuff, you know, his way of doing Schlossberg? Because, I mean, that's something that... Pretty right. much. Besides that, in Arbins, I mean, that's kind of the thread that ties all of the different camps. Right. Know? His his version, I mean, is really soft, and but he would extend it into the pedal range down to pedal C. Mm -hmm. um, then he would extend it up higher than, than the book would go. Mm -hmm. So if you got through the exercise, you know, it would take quite a long time. Yeah. And then, so with that and the breathing that, that he um, was teaching, it was just like you kind of learn to calm down as you're playing. And it's... Um, with the the air and just holding your breath and then letting it out and then you know it was all interesting because he wanted you to do the schlossberg in very strict time really right oh interesting so releases were in time your breath would be in time and the next yeah. note would be in time interesting because i was gonna say it kind of sounds like the bill adams stuff for a while in terms of like expanding the the schlossberg right but then yeah but strict the strict time thing would definitely kind of stray from that and what, yeah. what like what you mentioned about the breathing that did, what did he have a special way of teaching breathing or not necessarily or a in a way he wouldn't tell me how to breathe mm -hmm. but he would watch me breathe and then he would make make a comment um just to make sure that you're breathing in time so your attack is is connected to the end of your breath and sometimes he would say okay let's attack the note before you stop breathing hmm. so you're you know so you're getting the feeling of it never stopping he didn't want you to breathe and then have an attack he wanted it connected to the end of the breath so oh, it's interesting. in and out and then if you breathe in time of the piece then you're you're already on the train you're not stepping on the train. You're already on it when you, you're attacking the note. You have a time, wow. time center. So you actually have breathing on as the inhale's happening. Right. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's the first time yeah. I've ever heard that concept. That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, and my dad did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here I am. Like now I'm just like, yeah, I'm going off in my own little world here. I got to yeah. stay on the stay on. So you were at USC for yeah. four years. Uh, and then you decided to go out to, to Boston for graduate school. Is that correct? I did. Yeah. I auditioned in New York and um, in Boston. Mm -hmm. And mostly I wanted to get on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Just for a change of scenery? Or like, were you interested in like orchestral playing? And... I was interested in orchestral playing. And okay. I wanted to be in a place where a lot of orchestras would come through. And... I did not have a great experience in New York mm -hmm. at the audition, not not playing wise, but just being in a big city. And then I got to Boston. It just felt like home. Yeah. So my dad went to MIT and that was right across the way. And it was just like it felt like home. My brother was on the Boston Stock Exchange. OK. He lived in Plymouth. So it felt like home. Just across the Charles from yeah. MIT, and yeah, 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 and I just come back from there, so yeah. I could see why you'd want to go there. Yeah. Um, so, what, what was your time like with at NEC? Well, I studied with Robert Nagel, mm -hmm. so um, another studio player, another chamber musician. Mm -hmm. So fancy that I play in the studios and in chamber orchestra. Imagine that. Yeah. yeah. Nothing, yeah. nothing like that was planned. It was just um, my goal was to be in a, a orchestra that that was like a family and, and, and where you're appreciated. And, mm -hmm. and so, so I found that so with the chamber that. orchestra and the LA opera orchestra. So, yeah. So you, um, anything you particularly you want to talk about, uh, Nagel in terms of his teaching or what you got out of him? Yeah. They called him Captain Bob. Uh -huh. Um, he was, he would drive from Connecticut into Boston to teach us. He would spend the night. Um, I, Learned how to play trumpet at USC. Mm -hmm. And then at the conservatory, 
it was all about making music. Hmm. So our classes would be taught by string players or, you know, we'd, we'd go to master classes of, for vocal or for, for string playing. And then the cello master class, uh, one was given by Benjamin Zander, who's Jeez. the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic. Yeah. And um, it's just something clicked. Hmm. And so on the West Coast, I felt we're really conscious of the beginning of the note. In the mm. East Coast, I felt like they're really conscious on the endings of the notes. The releases. The releases together. Interesting. And that's the, what's, and, and, and you can, I mean, there was a big sound difference. When I came back from Boston, I, I couldn't play with the same, you know, the, I, 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 it, it, I got too, too dark and too, too, too big, and it, it wouldn't, wasn't working with the sound that, that was out here. Interesting. And Emma, was that partly an equipment thing, or was it just purely concept? Both. Both. Concept and equipment. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. And I mean, you were only there a few years, right? Two you years. Two years. But two years. In that time, yeah, you would have assimilated or whatever. Oh yeah. <laughs> Blended I mean, in with yeah. the Boston sound. And... Yeah, we were talking about the the Boston. My my first year was Rolf Smedvig's last year in the orchestra, mm -hmm. and he he was amazing. Yeah. And he was just, again, he's a chamber music player playing a principal trumpet job and that was really evident and then Charlie Schluter came in mm -hmm. and that his first year there was different than how he ended up mm -hmm. he didn't play like he played in I think was it Milwaukee yeah you know you or, hear uh, Minnesota Minnesota yeah. yeah um and those recordings are just amazing he didn't do that in Boston because he 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 was really refined the first year mm -hmm. Yeah, got to get yeah. tender, I guess, first or I, I whatever. Guess. I don't know. Although yeah. he's, when I interviewed him, he didn't seem too concerned either <laughs> about yeah. making tenure. He was happy to go wherever. Oh, um, yeah, he was wonderful, too, in, yeah. his, in, his, in his own way. But he didn't teach at the university. I mean, at the conservatory. Yeah. It was Robert Nagel and Andre Combe. Okay. So, I mean, with such a rich trumpet history in Boston, I mean, did you take lessons with other people when you were there or have the opportunity to perform with some of those players? Yeah, we brought in, we kind of had a, a trumpet group mm -hmm. and then we would uh, pool our money and we got Schluter to come in for a master class. We would, I took lessons with Andre Combe, mm -hmm. um, who's just nothing like he looked on, <laughs> on TV, you know, yeah. just really, he was a, just a wonderful human being, very positive, mm -hmm. um, and just just his teaching style was was really great. Yeah. But and Nagel is, you know, he had his he was a composer, um, and he would grew up, you know, in the '60s, and you know all the chordal harmony, mm -hmm. um, and his way of transposition was using the 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 alto clef or the K clef and just moving it wherever he wanted the C to be. And I was just, I could never wrap my head around that one. Interesting, you know? yeah. So, but, you know, transposition for him, it was more about playing music, doing the, the Borbnoni and, and just playing through phrases. So hearing it as opposed to right. doing the math, or right. so to speak. Right. Um, so you're finishing up your graduate degree. Was it an easy choice to come back to L.A., or was it... Uh, you know, was it was a very easy choice, yeah. yeah. I, I missed the, you know, I grew up in Long Beach. I missed, you know, the, the water in the sense of where it's not frozen. You know? <laughs> and you don't toss tea in it every yeah. so often or something like that. That's a terrible yeah. joke. But you, know, you went from <laughs> harbor to harbor. You went from harbor to haba. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, I mean, yeah. but did you have any interest in doing like the audition circuit? Do you skids? I did. So did I you, did. did so, you go on auditions or did you? Yeah, I went on auditions. Uh -huh. I was successful in the auditions. Um, I auditioned for Hong Kong twice. I won the audition both times, but I was too young to fill their their principal chair. Oh, well. So <laughs> then after the second audition, um, a, a month later, they asked me mm -hmm. to come over for three weeks. So that's when Ken Skrimmerhorn first got there. Hmm. And then I lasted three years over there. And then I, it was time to come back. Wow. So, so, I mean, were you freelancing at all? Or were you playing at all? I was. I was freelancing a lot. I played at Disney and the, the Fanfare Trumpets. I was mm -hmm. subbing in the band. 
Um, I was playing in all the, the local orchestras. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't subbing yet in the L.A. Phil. But I was studying with uh, Rob Roy McGregor. When you came out? Yeah, we had this okay. orchestra training program after my master's. Mm -hmm. So we did that, and we had to pay $5 a lesson. Oh, and, geez. Yeah. <laughs> For Rob McGregor, yeah. Rob Roy. Man. Yeah. So he was my finishing teacher, and he... You know, everything that I learned before, he just kind of made sense. Mm -hmm. and Kind of like um, the last puzzle pieces. Right. They're all together. Right. Yeah. And I also had a few lessons with Don Green. Um, and then in 1993, I won the, the Chamber Orchestra edition. Wow. Can, can, I'd so, like to, I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about Hong Kong, because that's also okay. just a big jump from being in Boston and L.A. Right. Uh, but also your first... That was my first job. Job in, in a major orchestra. Yeah. So what was that like? I mean, sitting in the it hot was, seat. It was great. Um, mm -hmm. Ken Schirmerhorn was a conductor, as I mentioned, and he was a trumpet player himself. Okay. So just the comments that he would make, they would help me out where, you know, to place the beat. How far mm -hmm. ahead do I need to be? And he, uh, again, was just like having another teacher. So... Um, we played a lot of major repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, I still have friends over there. Um, I'm not sure how, you know, with the, the current situation, you know, but they were yeah. still giving out Hong Kong loans for 30 years. Wow. So, geez. And any, uh, anything, I mean, obviously you had a great pedagogy, <laughs> you know, go, yeah. going through schools. I mean, anything you had to learn once now you were in the hot seat in terms of preparation or being able to actually do the job now? I think with the teachings of John Kleiman, you know, you're always prepared. You know, we know what the season is. And uh, I heard some things from her, Seth. He's like, he's, if the next week's going to be really loud playing, he's going to be practicing really soft. Mm -hmm. If it's really soft playing, then he's going to be practicing loud. He's practicing opposites before he's getting there. So that was... Interesting. I mean, our, our work schedule is only seven services a week. Mm -hmm. So um, when we would have two or three concerts. So it wasn't that overbearing. We didn't have two concerts going on every week of, okay. of different repertoire. It was the same repertoire every week. Yeah. So now, with that being said, then, did you have to fill up your time? Like, did, you, did they give you the opportunity to practice a lot? Or oh, were yeah. you also able to freelance? I yeah. Mean, well, I've always loved the water. So I oh. lived uh, um, on, a, on an island away from a, a Lantau Island, mm -hmm. a place called Discovery Bay. And um, so we, I was able to be on a, a boat every day traveling to work, which is, <laughs> it was, it. was a lot of fun. I love and it. And then the, uh, the, the, the places you would live there, the the walls were about two feet of cement, mm -hmm. you know, so it wasn't a problem of I could play and not bother anybody. Mm -hmm. So you were so practicing and... We were practicing all the time, and it was a very young orchestra. Mm -hmm. A lot of people from Chicago, a lot of... Uh, we had Australia, England, and um, most of the strings were from, from China. So it was a great mix of, mm -hmm. uh, of people yeah probably a fun so, hang too oh to it was great oh we hung yeah. out all the time yeah yeah what fun yeah. and but you obviously didn't stay there were you just looking for the opportunity to move back or the contract was up that sort of thing uh i was at i got married before my third season there mm -hmm. and my wife needed to finish one quarter mm -hmm. to to get her degree and if we didn't come back then it would take two years to finish her degree. And it was, I completed three seasons and then they started um, repeating repertoire. So I thought, it, I knew I wasn't going to stay out there. I wasn't a, a lifetime. I, it's kind of like being in Hawaii. It's it's really beautiful. It's great. But then you're on yeah. an island and pretty isolated. It kind of gets, yeah. 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 So, so you made it, it wasn't real easy to get into China at the time. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of off limits. Yeah. But so I came back and I started teaching at University of Redlands. Mm -hmm. So I was part of Redlands for 10 years. And then back in the freelance scene, I'm sure people still yeah. remembered you from when you were out here. And... Yeah, that's interesting, though. I mean, it's just like you, you've you got to start over. <laughs> it's you back know? at the bottom of the <laughs> yeah. list again. And yeah. Yeah, working yeah. your way up. Um, and then, like you said, so then the, the position came open at uh, the Chamber Orchestra, right? LA Chamber right. Orchestra. 
And right, after Mario Granari retired from the Chamber Orchestra, and then they had an audition. So that was, when was that? You said 1993? 1993. 93. Yeah, this is my 31st season. Wow. Yeah. Man. <laughs> and back then, it, the Chamber Orchestra was the opera orchestra. Uh-huh. And then, That's so, right. Back then, it was yeah. both, right? So you Yeah. Were... So we kind of, um, I kind of stayed in with, with both groups. Mm-hmm. And that's as and that's as a trump player, it's gotta be fun. Some interesting repertoire and oh, yeah. and to be able to go back and forth between the, the, the opera rep and then and the, the chamber orchestra does a whole variety of stuff as right. well. A lot um, of new music as well, which yeah. is which is a lot of challenges and fun and working with the composers is always fun. Yeah. Um yeah, which I, I well actually I mean since you brought that up, let's let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, and you've done the, the Brandenburg how many times now? Oh I'm it, probably around 170, 175 times. I'm about ready to go to New York in December for a tour. Wow. We're going to do it um, 10 times in 14 days. So you can, do you, do you have like a notches on your Not practice room? No. <laughs> notches I, I should, on the belt I something? Should keep, well, I mean, with the Chamber Music Society in New York, Lincoln Center, um, I've done it, this is 20 years now. And we're doing nine performances this time. So I, I know I'm close to 100 with them. Yeah. Just with that group alone. I remember we had uh, Reinhold Friedrich on, and I think he right. had a running tally. And you know, I mean, of course, being yeah. in Europe, I mean, they probably play oh. it every weekend there. Right. But he's in the hundreds, I think, yeah. you know. Um, what, so I mean, getting, let's just start from square one with the Brandenburg. Okay. You know, if you're working with a student, like, what are some tips to start working that up? I mean. Having good quality time on the pickle. Okay. And what does that it's, look like? It's not I mean, something you just pick up and, and play. Mm-hmm. So I um, use uh, Clark 4, and it's just in the same tempo that the first movement of the Brandenburg in. Mm-hmm. And I start on the first one, I'll, I'll slur it, and then I'll go up a half step and then tongue it. And I try to do it at a tempo that's, you know, like 104, that's going to be in between the third and the first movement, so you're just getting used to tonguing, mm-hmm. um, getting used to the resistance. And then you just building up endurance playing the instrument. So then you take it up, you know, whatever your comfortable range is, and you want to get that consistent so you can have that as, as normal. Um, and then I do the, the Robert Nagel... Showed me the the twelve caprices and etudes by Maurice Andre. Oh yeah, yeah. So I'll play one of those every every day now mm-hmm. to get get ready, and that's harder than the actual Brandenburg. The Brandenburg's really not that difficult <laughs> in a sense of the notes. Yeah. It, the difficulty is blending with the other instruments and having the endurance of the range. Mm-hmm. So. Um, and it's just something that came really naturally to me. So, so. It's, a, it's a gradual, you know, gradual build yeah. up, and then, but also not ignoring the piccolo. That, yeah, I think it's time, and you have to put a lot of time in. You know, it has to be consistent. It's not something you can just pick up. Now, is there in when you do a lot of piccolo, do you feel like it takes away from the bigger horns? In the beginning, it did because mm-hmm. I was really. Um, you know, I was getting really fatigued in the upper register, you know. I had to come up with a way to be, uh, I mean, the longer I play piccolo, the the less difficult it, it was to, to play in the upper range. Mm-hmm. You just learn how to do it. And in the B-flat trumpet, you know, you're, you can fight it. You can, you can, you know, just really push hard and get good results. And mm-hmm. piccolo, you can't do that. Yeah. You fight piccolo, it wins every time. <laughs> it fights back, yeah. yeah. <laughs> For a little thing, yeah. man. It's, it yeah. takes a punch, right? So, and yeah. then it was just, you know, it's funny. I mean, Mouthpiece-wise, I just play a 7E. Mm-hmm. And back then, we had to ask for a 117. Yeah. And then I, that was John Klein said, you play this. And I was like, okay. And then I went away from that and then came full circle back to that. Back to it, um, yeah. In the 90s. So, I mean, it was, you know, 15 years of... of trying to figure it out and then i finally figured out it's not the mouthpiece it's just it's time on the horn time on the horn yeah and as a mouthpiece maker we we agree yeah <laughs> you know a lot of people say oh, i don't say it's not the mouthpiece and it was like no it's that's exactly yeah. it it's time on the horn right um and it's and you still use the 70 i still do so they, the 117 yeah. yeah 
And, but, and which is also, I mean, not to get too geeky, and but you play a larger size when you're playing the the bigger horns, right? Right. But switching yeah. down to the smaller diameter doesn't yeah mess you up when you're playing. No, that was another John Kleiman lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted you to find the right mouthpiece for the horn, find the right blowing resistance that you can deal with mm -hmm. on the horn. You know, front end, back end, whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's different for every horn for me, mm -hmm. you know. And he also taught me about clocking the mouthpiece, mm -hmm. you know, putting the, the, the number at different, and you, you'll, he says one time someone probably looked at his mouthpiece, he left his trumpet on the chair, and, you yeah. know, and he came back, man, it kind of doesn't feel right. <laughs> and sure enough, his mouthpiece was turned a little bit. It might know? have been Bob, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it might have been Bob, but you know, he, he might have gotten into that. Um, yeah. So, and then in the, the, on the flip side of the Brandenburg too, that I also want to address, um, because I mean, you can work the thing up till you're blue in the face in the practice room, but then when you actually get in the chamber group and have to play it in right. front of people, um, like, I mean, I've, just full disclosure, I've never played the Brandenburg, but I've played a few of the box in college. Uh -huh. And to me, like the the nerve wracking thing is that, you know, you don't have a trumpet section with you. Like no. there's, you're out there. Right. Like, did you have that experience or like, or just the nerves of now that you have to play it for front, in front of people? Like how did, did you have that number one? And number two, if you did, how did you get over that? Well, luckily I was, had a few, my very first concert with Chamber Orchestra was at Brandenburg. <laughs> Oh man! The nice so, thing hey, was, welcome it, it to was, the club. It, like, welcome it was, to the group. It was right on the beach, and it was yeah. a beach concert in Malibu, and it was like okay. we were looking at the sunset as we're playing. So it was really relaxing. Yeah. Well, you were at you home know? then. You were, yeah. At, you know, yeah. yeah. Watch the boats go so, by. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's just about the musicality and how you fit in, finding the the right instrument. Mm -hmm. um, I my first I played a scherzer for many years. On the B flat side, mm -hmm. and um, my first brand with the chamber orchestra was on that. Then Bob Malone called up and said, "Hey, I've got this C piccolo." So, and that really was home for the Brandenburg. Mm -hmm. It plays in C, B flat, and A, but it only plays in C well. The C piccolo, yeah. So that's so that matches the same effort I'm putting in on the the Scherzer is 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 a softer volume on the. The C piccolo, and it just has a, a little bit smaller sound that matches, and you they you can hear the other instruments through it. Interesting, so yeah. that fits in. Wow, yeah. But uh, other than that, you said just getting into the musicality of it. Yeah, you don't have time to think of nerves because you you're just no. And it's knowing when your part's important, when mm -hmm. is your part not important? Mm -hmm. What do you leave out? You know, mm -hmm. if things aren't, you know, endurance, you need, you need a little break. What notes can you you leave out? So I kind of have a, a pattern of, I know what works for me now. Yeah. So You have your escape route, oh, <laughs> so yeah. to speak. It's like the yeah. runaway one run, uh, runaway truck ramp, you know, like yeah. you know, the place you can go and then get back in. Yeah. Yes. So all having a game plan. Right. But it sounds like it all comes down to just preparation, like you said. Right? It is. And, it is. And getting confidence in your preparation. Hmm. And since I've done it so much, I, I know where I am in the preparation and that, that it's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are they they lose before they they get on stage, because it it's it can be terrifying, mm -hmm. and we don't play well when we're terrified. Yeah, yeah. Great advice, great advice. I'd like to talk because besides the chamber orchestra and the opera and all that stuff, you are in the studios all the time. Um, how did that side of your career develop? I mean, that was it's really interesting. I never planned for it. Mm -hmm. um, the story goes, I was in Hong Kong. Jorge Mester, mm -hmm. George Mester, was our principal guest. And he was um, conducting Pasadena at the time. Mm -hmm. So he had me call, when I was coming back to L.A., Nathan Kaproff. Mm -hmm. And just to get on the sub list for Pasadena. Well, it ends up that they needed, I played on Fountains of Rome and Pines of Rome concert. And um, at that time, after that concert, um, James Horner had a spot open up in his section. Really? And so because of Jorge Mester and Nathan Kaparov, I got into that, that session. And Do you then, know what, you know what was it? It was a film, I'm assuming? It was a uh, film, and it was, uh, it was with Harrison Ford. 
um, I, I'm blanking on <laughs> on the name right now. We can uh, <laughs> we can yeah. have all of our, our internet <laughs> sleuths on the internet uh, <laughs> figuring out. So Horner session with Harrison Ford. We'll uh, we'll see if uh, Preston comes up with that. Yeah. Um, so the film probably wasn't that memorable, but do you remember the it session? Was. Oh, it was. It, oh, it was it was amazing. Um, it was Warren Looney, Burnett Dillon, and myself. That wow. We were the, the section. It was right after um, the Rocketeer. Oh, fun. So, so. Um, and then also uh, we did Casper with that section. We mm -hmm. did um, a few other things. And then the principal trumpet opened up mm -hmm. and because of Nathan Kaparov, um, I was given a chance. At so that. did you play principal? I started or... playing principal in Courage Under Fire. Okay. With Meg Ryan. But so not on that section yeah. though. The first session. No, I was part section. of the section. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah. So with Burnett and and Warren. Yeah. What was that like? You got played with that. Amazing. I mean, had you played Amazing. with them before? Or I actually was at USC with Burnett. Okay. Burnett was a, a doctoral student when I was a a sophomore or yeah. a junior. So I've, I I have known Burnett mm -hmm. and Warren was a, a legend. Yeah. You know, it was so just, you find yeah. yourself sitting in a section with yeah. those guys. What was yeah. that? What was that it like? Was, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. It was yeah. just, you know, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And um, Warren was such a, a, a gracious leader mm -hmm. and it was really helpful to me. So. I was gonna say you're not quite a young kid at that point, but still, I mean, yeah, I was still 30, fairly young. Thirty four, I believe. Yeah, thirty three. Yeah. Wow. Which yeah. I mean, you know, we've we've talked to other folks, obviously, on here, John Lewis and whatnot, who said that you know it's a can be a long process. Oh yeah. To get into the studios, depending on when things are opening, you know, and uh, guys don't tend to retire from the studios, right? You know, uh, so but you found yourself in relatively quickly. Right. Uh, was it a thing we started working well, regularly? It was, right. Well, I had just won the chamber orchestra job. Okay. So it kind of collated with that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's been a wonderful ride. Yeah. 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 So, and the studio scene is weird because there's different contractors, different composers. So, right. how did that, like, did you just start propagating through the different composers and contractors through the years? or Well, Horner was Nathan Kaproff, and then it turned into Sandy DeCrescent. Mm -hmm. So, then I became part of Sandy DeCrescent's section. Which folks which outside of LA may not know, but Sandy DeCrescent was the, the did top, everything. Did everything at that yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. So. And then now hundreds of movies later, and, yeah. and TV, and pretty much everything else. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's been quite quite a ride. Yeah, I've been very lucky. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the skill set, though, like, is that you find it's? I mean, it's a different kind of playing, right? Playing in the studios, and if you're playing the Brandenburg or oh, know, it's totally different. Yeah. yeah, what's well back when we first started, we weren't able to have the music beforehand. Mm -hmm. Now they send out the music a couple of days before, mm -hmm. so you know what you have to bring. Mm -hmm. Back then, I mean, Malcolm, you know, had we carrying carts full of cases because we didn't know what we were going to need yeah you know so we were carrying seven different trumpets cornets and and flugelhorns and and whatever trunk full of mutes yeah. like yeah oh I mean, yeah we just didn't you, know so you literally had just, to bring, bring your everything. studio and have it in your yeah. home, in your car right yeah and so now it's kind of nice that you know what you're gonna to bring mm -hmm. so and then uh and a lot of times now especially if there's you still don't really get the music ahead of time, do you? Or is it? Oh yeah, they, get, they send it. They, yeah, they give a it. Dropbox most of the time now. Wow, you have that. The luxury. The oh thing. yeah. Well, and also <laughs> when I first started to yeah. to have a take start, it took about fifteen to thirty seconds to line up the movie with the the. Um, it's before Pro Tools. Yeah. So it it took time just to get the 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 sync to happen between the. The, the film and the, the sound. You were actually recording to the film. Yeah. Right. So you've, you've bridged yeah. that, that technical, technological yeah. gap. And now it's instantaneous. Yeah. And, and then when Pro Tools first came out, it was just like, we'd have breaks all the time. Uh, oh, we got to reboot Pro Tools, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, any, I mean, of all the sessions you've been on, any particular memorable ones, either because of the music you're playing or because something crazy happened? Um. I guess I really enjoyed the 
being part of the James Horner mm -hmm. group for so long. Um, I was part of the John Williams section for 25 years. Yeah. So that that was also the these names, you know, James Newton Howard. Uh, it, the list goes on, but there's a, a, a com composers that their music stands on its own, mm -hmm. as well as being a wonderful part of the movie and, and fitting in. Yeah, um, Michael Giacchino, you mm -hmm. know, it's just it's just so much fun to play. And then there there's other times when the the music is not; it's just more effects than than. Anything and it's just like I, I Warren Learning said, yeah, it's like, you know, studio work is is ninety five percent boredom and five percent sheer terror. <laughs> and that's true. And that's yeah. the thing, you know, the folks outside of the industry now don't realize that. I mean, you're just sitting yeah. around a lot or waiting for yeah. mics to set up or what you know, engineers yeah. or whatever this and that, and then all of a sudden you just have to play yeah. the Tomasi or you know something yeah. like crazy, you yeah. know, or it's a sound effect and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, but it is true what you're talking about. The composers that you've worked with are, you know, not just the biggest names of our time, but really like that lineage of classical music and scores yeah. stands alone. And that's why we listen to it on Spotify now or on CDs yeah, and stuff. It's amazing. Yeah. You take away the actors and that you know, the music yeah. still stands out and you get to sight read it. Right. You know, basically. Yeah. Um, and also what, what I was fascinated about your career is like you do a lot of principal trumpet, but then you're also in the section. Can you speak a little bit about the difference in the roles and what you have to do when you show up, you know, being in the hot seat versus then, having to just make the section sound, not say just, but your role is more of making the section sound good. Right. Well, we're at a point now where everybody's played together for so long with each other. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of, you know, you're supposed to lead the section when you're the principal player, but you don't have to say anything anymore. It's just everybody knows how to follow. And it's just like when you're sitting in the section, you're not leading anymore. You're being a part of the section. And so it's how you're, you're using your ears. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in the section, I'm more attuned to the trumpet section. And when I'm in the principal section, I'm more attuned to the other groups that we're sitting around, the trombones, the horns, whatever, for phrasing. So it's more of the hierarchy of right. listening down the line versus, yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. And you, yeah. yeah, I mean, it is. So it's just second nature now. It's not something that, you know. Yeah. And, and even though L.A. is a big town, it's a pretty similar rotation of players right um between the sessions but like for the john williams stuff it was basically the same three or four guys right it was john it, and you and well before yeah. that it, w it was malcolm tim morrison john and myself okay yeah the early know, ones. so then it, it evolved in, in into john lewis and um barry dan rosenboom and myself yeah and what what I love about the John Williams stuff is he'd still record with the full orchestra, right? Absolutely. And do you still prefer that versus oh, just absolutely. striking with the brass or even just the trumpet? Absolutely. Yeah. Why is it, it? I mean, it seems obvious, but why? Well, it, it's everybody's in the same time mm -hmm. when they're they're playing. That sounds kind of stupid to say that, but when you're striping, they've you're not physically with them, and they've already set the. The, you have to fit into something that's already set, and there's no give and take. And they might have given and taken where, you know, if we're all playing together, it wouldn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's more of a challenge. The pitch is more of a challenge because it's you're not playing together. Yeah. You know, you're, you're hearing it in your, your headphones, and that's not the the way you would hear it naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it just to so, me, just being in a room with strings and woodwinds and right. stuff, it's just that's organic sound yeah. just has to be so cool <laughs> but on the yeah. other end of that i totally understand why they want control over that mm -hmm. it's not for a live performance it's it's fitting in and, and how they want the balance to be yeah and it's probably a lot easier digitally to adjust right it all comes down to money right yeah it comes down well to that, that's the thing it's all yeah economics yeah yeah the uh, strings will be there for a double session. They bring the brass in for a single. Mm -hmm. You know, we just don't have as much to play as 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 they do. Yeah, darn woodwinds. Yeah, <laughs> but then we're not sitting around as much, so you know, it's yeah, yeah. It, the the time goes faster. 
I mean, there's stories of the old guys that would like write books and do things in their downtime, <laughs> you know, oh. or have old side businesses that they're doing while they're counting rest yeah. or on their tacit sheets and things, but less of yeah. that these days because it's more, uh, yeah, there's not, not as much, uh, free time. Yeah. Less yeah. hijinks too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, you talked about, you know, your, the Kleiman's influence in terms of practicing extreme. So if you have a really loud week, you're practicing tops and so forth. Right. Um, but that being said, like with your regular playing schedule, do you have like a, a typical routine that you do? Um, or does it vary quite a, quite a bit based on what you're playing? What does that look like? Um, I have a, a, a warm up routine I do every day. Every day. And that's Religious what thing? I worked out with uh, Rob Marie McGregor. Oh, okay. So, um, that's something I do every day. And if I'm working a lot, then, you know, you don't have a lot of time to, to practice. If mm -hmm. you don't have a lot, then I will do a calisthenic sort of exercise, endurance exercise, be it Jimmy Stamp, be it what, whatever routine I, I want mm -hmm. to go through. And then it's practicing music, making sure that my creative um, drive is still there. So it can be revisiting a, a Charlie A etude. It can be revisiting a, um, you know, a Tomasi trumpet concerto. It's just mm -hmm. whatever you, you want to be working on. Mm -hmm. So I'm preparing the Brandenburg right now, but I'm also going through some, you know, concerto St. Mark, you know, Albinoni. I'm doing other things on the instruments so I can be more versatile when I get back to the Brandenburg. I'm not just in Brandenburg mode. And keep uh, keep things fresh and yeah. creative. And so it sounds like you mix it up a lot just to yeah. just keep it. Yeah. On, uh, There's honest. no set to the mixing, you know, it's just yeah. whatever I feel like in the day. Would you mind talking a little bit more about what you said, the, the, the warm up routine that you do or that you got from Rob Roy? Is it yeah, the, it's uh interesting. I, I start with a breathing exercise every day. I want to stretch out my lungs. I want to get them ready to, 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 to play. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like having my first note just being on the trumpet. Mm -hmm. So um, then I'll do a lip buzz without the mouthpiece for 10, 15 seconds just to get blood in my chops. Uh, it has nothing to do with playing trumpet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, playing mouthpiece has very little to do with playing trumpet. It's not the same, but it gets me focused and it gets my pitch center mm -hmm. going. So then when I do get to the trumpet, you know, a minute or two after doing that, um, it feels like I've already played a little bit. So then you can concentrate on your sound. You can concentrate on, on the attacks and stuff. So I start simply just by the overtone series and I go under chromatics and, um, airflow studies are important. Mm -hmm. So he has a airflow study by anonymous. We haven't figured out who it is yet, but I've been doing it, you know, well, for anonymous 40 is years. Bro they're brilliant. Yeah. Anonymous has written yeah. some great stuff through the years. Yeah. Last 500 years. <laughs> yeah. And a little bit of lip yeah. flexibility and then, uh, I'm ready to go. And the interesting thing over the years is just like, if I have an hour break, I'm mm -hmm. fine. If I have a five hour break, it's fine. It's, I'm already warmed up for the day. So, yeah. So like this is the muscle memory or just the yeah or you know, muscle me memory yeah. and confidence to, yeah you know it's there yeah which also probably helps in the studios as well where you right. can sit for an hour and to yeah. pick up and play and then, yeah you know it's there fascinating well, yeah and I mean a big part for that was is that in Hong Kong it was um, if I did have a big break it it wasn't I wasn't as as confident coming back in mm -hmm. so um, that was a learned something a learned, over the years that's yeah. developed yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. So, and I know you, on, on top of all this stuff, you still teach a lot. In fact, I mean, when I was in Northridge, you were teaching there. Right. Uh, but uh, now you teach at Biola now, right? And, I'm at Biola and, and APU. A APU, Azusa Pacific. Yeah. I was at five universities at the, the height. Mm -hmm. I've taught most every university except USC here, <laughs> where, I, where I attended. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it, what do you, um, with your, your younger players, obviously it's, a musical career is not the easiest to get into. Um, right. Is there any kind of advice you give them, your, your students, in terms of what paths to take or how to how to develop a you know if they want to do what you do, uh, what paths to take to get there? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Everybody I teach is you know obviously a different person and different goals. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you know that they're not going to be a, a professional player, but they really enjoy playing trumpet. Mm -hmm. So I give them the tools that will help them keep on playing. And, you know, it's 
again, it's just play music, play music. Yeah, calisthenics are important, mm -hmm. you know, but play, we play trumpet to make music. You know, that's the enjoyment for me. Mm -hmm. um, the people that are really wanting music as a career, um, I try to tell them that you really have to enjoy the process mm -hmm. of improving. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can be difficult on yourself, but don't be mean to yourself. Okay. So you want a positive, you know, feedback, you know, if it's not perfect and not where you want it, that's fine. You still have the process of, of, of getting it there. Mm -hmm. And then when you learn how to practice, then this, everything that you've, you've put in your bag of tricks is going to come out quicker. So you, you, you can improve at a quicker rate yeah so that's yeah that's absolutely brilliant because i feel like there's just the dichotomy of you know like the climate like having the high standard right and being hard on yourself to reach that standard but also not lose sight of the fact that look we're playing a shiny object right. with three valves oh and we're making music you know right and all that and not losing that sight so yeah. combining that um is yeah that's fascinating and yeah and i feel like you know, I always, people ask, you know, here, you know, hey, I'm moving to L.A., you know, I want to make it as a studio musician or whatever. And right. it's like, it's not the easiest thing to do, but you never want to deter someone. No, who no, really no, no. has the dream I, because obviously right. people like yourself and John Lewis and Dan and, right. you know, they had the dream and made it happen. And, right. you know, it's possible, but also right. having a sense of reality. <laughs> right. You know. Right. Um, you never know what door is going to open up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can be a studio musician all you want and then other doors are going to open up and you're going to have a wonderful career yeah doing uh, something else besides that i mean for me yeah. i never wanted to be a studio musician but that door opened up or hey mister and, and, and who yeah, thunk? yeah you know so it's just it's you know but be prepared once that door opens up yeah fascinating um, I want to talk a little bit about equipment. I mean, okay. Not to get too geeky, but you're a Yamaha artist. I am a Yamaha artist. And you artist. have some cool, uh, was it the Piccolo, right, that uh, you designed uh, with Bob I Malone? I was or? a guinea pig for that. Okay. I Bob Malone and I have known each other since our USC days, mm -hmm. marching band. Fight on. Uh, yeah, there you go. And <laughs> Dr. It, Bartner it, and all them. All he's had something you know. to do with every every horn I have. Yeah. You know, even the, the couple non-Yamaha uh, mm -hmm. horns that I play. Um, I've played the Scherzer for oh, 45 years now. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's never. <laughs> and he helped, he designed a, an A lead pipe for it for me. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, I'm kind of lost track of your question. Yeah, what, just what, well, see, the, the, the Piccolo. Right. right. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the Piccolo. your model. Right? It's, it's the, the model that I helped, uh -huh. and uh, John Hagstrom was also part of that. Okay. Um, and it was just, I would go in and I would play and give my two cents on what okay. it was. So I still have that prototype. Oh, cool. So it's a little bit different than the ones that they, they, they sent out, mm -hmm. and my lead pipes are a little bit different because we were trying to choose the lead pipes, and then they came up with something else. Mm -hmm. And then I... I tried it and I didn't get to keep that one, so I don't have have the one that's coming as things, out. As things yeah. will go, yeah. And, you know, and that's a funny thing. Like people always say about you know artist models and this and that. Well, the guys at the you know if you're the actual artist, it's some custom made thing. And it's like it's not yeah. always the case, and especially like in the case of Yamaha, like the, yeah. the thing that you actually play yeah. versus what they make and works it's, for more it's people. It's very similar. Yeah. It's, at some point, you have to put something yeah. in production, and right. that's different than something that's just yeah. been handmade in the back of Bob Malone's you yeah. know, little bag of tricks kind of thing. Yeah, and, and it's uh, very interesting that they they include the cornet and the trumpet chain. Make it versatile yeah. for whatever the player Because everybody uses. feels different on Yeah, that. yeah, and they're wonderful horns. Yeah. I'm not just saying that because you're sitting here. We've had a few come in here, and I was like, yeah, maybe I need a Yamaha yeah. Piccolo. Uh, I don't even yeah. play Christmas Eve and Easter anymore, so I can't even play it twice a year, but I love playing Piccolo, and it's a fun yeah. horn to play on. But what uh, you talk about the other, you, E flat, D, B flat, C, I mean, you're using everything. Everything, yeah. yeah. What, what do you use? Um, well, models? I have the third generation Chicago C trumpet. Okay. Um, I just found the B flat I can finally play from Yamaha, and it's the new Bobby Shoe, uh, the lacquered version mm -hmm. um, of his his um, 
It's just the Bobby Shoe model. Yeah, they, I think it was the yeah. 8310Z yeah, still something, or something like yeah, that. I'm horrible with numbers. Which is which is interesting because yeah. that was originally a kind of a lead horn, right? But it's evolved. It, like Dan brought yeah. one up the other day, and it, I mean, it sounds yeah like a great yeah all around B flat trumpet. So yeah. that's cool. So using that, and then uh, Yamaha E flat. Do you use E flat much? I I mean, probably I, in the I, chamber orchestra, right? Yeah, or, uh, but on E flat, I use mostly a, a Bach conversion that Bob. Bob did. Mm -hmm. um, I have the large bore long bell D E flat. I use it only in D. Hmm. And then on the Yamaha, also I have the the tunable bell one. I use that in E flat mm -hmm. um, for solo work. Yeah, yeah. What and then I have the the C piccolo. I have the the other uh, piccolo that I use only in A now. Mm -hmm. The model that I helped. And then uh, uh, I have the flugelhorn, the mm -hmm. Wayne Bergeron model. Also in lacquer. Nice. I'm a big fan of the lacquer for yeah. some reason. <laughs> it has a total different feel for me, and I'm just yeah. enjoying that. Yeah, wonderful. And then yeah. uh, so, and we talked about the seven seven uh, E. Uh, what's your main mouthpiece right. for the big horns? Um, well, it used to be a one and a half C. Mm -hmm. Now, as I'm getting older, it's uh, I've switched to a six C. Really. Yeah, that's one of my favorite mouthpieces. And it's it, kind of it, like it a... helps me out. I have an old Mount Vernon one, and I have. Different ones that I've just been trying to. I think the six C is kind of the sleeper of the Bach line because yeah. everyone knows the seven C and the five C. Right. And when we came out with our classical series, we decided to yeah. Bob and us decided to do a six C instead because yeah. that's a that's a great piece. Yeah. So that's well, cool. I read <laughs> something that the the volume inside it is very close to the the one and a half mm -hmm. because there's a bigger bowl or something yeah. with the C in the shape of the cup. So yeah. yeah. So it's it's it feels the same way. Yeah. It's got a so a big sound. But a right. smaller diameter, so you don't yeah. have to work in, quite as hard. In chamber orchestra, I use mostly my D trumpet. Uh -huh. So just so I'm not, you know, the C trumpets now are so full of projection and sound that it's uh -huh. easier for me to be on the D trumpet and match the sound of a chamber orchestra instead of a full symphony orchestra. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Okay. We've been geeky enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I you know it's funny, like I always forget to ask the equipment question and then people say, Oh, why did they want to know? They want to know. Yeah. Um I, a couple quick questions here. Um, and these may just fall flat or not, and we can always edit them out. All right. Um number one, articulation tip. Articulation tip. I learned this from John Kleiman. He was very big on his style. Um a lot of times we're told never to stop the note with your tongue mm -hmm. but then he would gauge the length of the note with his tongue so if you want space then you know you would do it with your tongue and not stopping the air so is it you're still having support behind the tongue so that that never stops that never changes so you're 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 changing the length of the note with your tongue hmm. desert island what book do you take, or what etude book do you take? Charlie. Who do you listen to? Trumpet players, non-trumpet players? I don't listen to a lot of music. Um, <laughs> I'm involved in it so much every day. It's yeah. it's. But I'm really enjoying Caleb. Mm -hmm. It's in, I think he's fabulous. He has a new trio that that's out that just just blows me away. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember when he came through town with the Canadian brass and yeah, it's he, just, he, I mean, both he, it was Chris Coletti as well. Both of them are yeah. Fantastic, oh, absolutely. You know, uh, yeah. but yeah, when they were in here, it was like, man, you know, yeah. we're going to hear about him one yeah. day. Certainly. Yeah, my yeah. favorite piccolo player right now is Matthias Holst. Oh, uh, yeah. He's just so musical. So technically pure, mm -hmm. but it's so musical while being technically yeah. pure. It's, it's, it's wonderful to listen to. Yeah, absolutely love him. I can't believe it. it's already been over an hour. Really? <laughs> we could talk wow. all day. Dave, uh, any any uh, upcoming projects or anything going on? Or just, you, I mean, you said you're going to New York, playing the Brandenburg. and Yeah, I have the know, Brandenburg yeah. tour. Um, just starting my 31st year in the chamber orchestra, 31st year in the opera orchestra. Yeah. Um, and getting my boat ready for retirement. Wow. <laughs> Where are you going to sail? Where are you going to go? Uh, well, that's another thing I want to say is just as much as we're involved in our trumpet, involved in our music, it's have something that you enjoy doing that's not involved in music. Mm -hmm. 
you know, something that you can just take your mind off. For me, when I'm on the ocean, it's just pure relaxation. Do you practice on the boat? All the time. Do you have a... <laughs> I'll actually go out there in the middle, turn everything off, and then I'll just practice out if it's not too rough out there. Is it, is it easier after playing, like with the waves and stuff, like right. being on solid ground and playing? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's the secret. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Absolutely, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, well, website or you're not on social media or anything, right? You're uh, just... I have a Facebook account, but I'm not into social media you don't very do much. Thing, so. I don't have a website. So I'm kind of like the last part of the last generation that that doesn't have one <laughs> so well but yeah i mean we'll, we'll have links because i think to your yamaha page and your bios on the right. chamber orchestra and stuff so yeah and they're probably linked to the brandenburgs in the the chamber music society yeah, so we'll get all that on our it, music so. at menlo yeah awesome well absolute pleasure to have you on before i let you go um and you might have already answered this with the 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 boat question but uh, if you could leave our listeners with your best piece of advice what would that be i think i already said this yeah. uh be really hard on yourself, but don't be mean. Enjoy the process of, of improving. Yeah. Can't say it better myself. Absolute wonderful advice. Dave, thanks for being on here. Thanks. My pleasure. Well, a huge thank you to David for spending his morning up here at the shop. Uh, he could be a million places, like out on his boat or in the studios. And so, uh, so grateful, grateful for him to uh, haul up to the shop and share so many great stories, especially John, Joan LaRue and John Kleiman, who uh, are folks that were very influential here in Southern California, but may not be household names outside of the area. Uh, but certainly their playing and teaching uh, should be more well-renowned. Um, and also, I mean, just the great advice that uh, Dave, I knew, would have <laughs> to share. Uh, he was teaching at Cal State Northridge uh, when I was there as a student, and so I certainly knew uh, of him and his teaching. A lot of his students uh, were close colleagues of mine, and uh, I went to a number of his master classes, so I knew uh, what kinds of things he'd be sharing, and I'm glad he was able to share a lot of that with you today. So again, huge thanks uh, to Dave for doing this podcast. Um, and one thing I do want to mention, uh, we weren't quite sure which his, uh, what his first, uh, James Horner film was that he played on and it was clear and present danger. So for those of you that were, uh, furiously Googling or binging or duck, duck going or whatever you search, use to search these days, uh, clear and present danger was that first James Horner session that he was on. So there you go. A little, little bit of uh, trivial pursuit there. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we have some wonderful guests coming up, so make sure you hit that subscribe button. I don't just mention this every episode uh, just because I like talking. It's because it really makes a difference, both in terms of the algorithm with you know getting the other side of the bell out there in front of other folks like yourself that may be interested in the podcast, uh, but also the reviewing also helps us a lot, so submitting that five-star review because it, like I said, people are searching for trumpet content or brass content. Uh, they hope, uh, I hope that the other side of the bell shows up for them. Uh, a little cross promotion here. If you want to listen to some trombone interviews, we have the trombone corner. It's been a while since I've mentioned that. Uh, me and my good buddy, Noah Gladstone, co-host the trombone corner. And we've had a lot of great guests on there. Christian Lindbergh, uh, Jay Friedman. Uh, recently we had Bill Reichenbach, uh, and Andy Martin. So, uh, those that are interested in studio playing and, uh, Certainly trumpet players that know the Big Fat Band and the Jerry Hayhorn section. A lot of great stories from those two interviews, uh, as well as some other great guests as well. Uh, and we will be starting the Horn Signal podcast pretty soon, so we'll have our, uh, our French horn friends as well. So keep an eye out for that. That's all I have for today. Stay tuned for the next episode of The Other, the other Side of the Bell. Until then, let's go out and make some music. <laughs>